All right. Well, today we are on, we're continuing with the spiritual disciplines and we are on fasting and prayer or prayer and fasting. Usually everyone says prayer and fasting. Uh, so I should probably say that too. But anyways, I think fasting is everyone's favorite topic. People get very excited when they hear about fasts. <laughs> In Psalm 69.10, David wrote, When I wept and chastened my soul with fasting, that became my reproach. And that's just a verse that fills you with joy, that just makes you want to fast, right? <laughs> then I wept and chastened my soul, and that became my reproach. But David did that, and this is one of the disciplines that he had was fasting. And it's one of the things that led him to get to that place where God would say, this is a man after my own heart. In Psalm 5, 2 through 3, it says, Give heed to the voice of my cry, my King and my God, for to you I will pray. My voice you shall hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning I will direct it to you, and I will look up. David prayed. In fact, David was one of those people that talks about things like early in the morning I will rise to seek you. You know, he wanted to start everything off with prayer. I'm more of the, let me shower and drink a chai tea. And then we're going to, you know, I'll talk to you through that, but we're going to really pray when I can stay awake. So, but David, you know, David had this thing where he was like, I want God to be the first thing in my life when I wake up and I want him. And if you see him, he prays throughout the entire day. And it's very important to him. So we're going to talk about fasting and praying. And the reason that we're going to talk about these together is because it is possible and actually very common that you can pray without fasting, but you cannot fast without praying. If you fast without praying, that's just a diet. It's actually not even that great of a diet. But anyways, <clears throat> when you see this, like in Acts 13, 3, it says, then having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. Or in 14, 23, so when they had appointed elders in every church and prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. You always see prayer attached to fasting. It's, it's just always there. Now, sometimes you might see a verse, like the very first one I read, that did not mention praying in it, it just mentioned fasting. But if you continue to read that psalm, you'll see that it's a psalm of prayer to God. And in, in it, he just mentions that he's also fasting. And so when Jesus talked about it, he talked about it as though this is a done deal. So if we go back to the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' uh, probably most famous sermon ever delivered, probably the most famous sermon ever delivered, in Matthew 6, 5 through 7, he says, And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, <clears throat> for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut the door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. And then we're going to jump down to verse 16 of that same chapter in Matthew 6, 16 through 18. He says, Moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear to men to be fasting. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face so that you do not appear to men to be fasting, but to your father who is in the secret place and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. There's an implied command here. Or maybe uh, in, <clears throat> if you ever have done like a sales presentation or gone, not a presentation, gone to a sales training course, which I haven't, but I have seen them they have this thing called the assumptive close. The assumptive close is like when you present a product to someone, you say, so how many of these should I put you down for? Not, would you like to buy some or would you not like to buy some? It's just how many would you like to buy, right? The assumption is you're going to buy some. The only question is how many? Well, Jesus kind of does the assumptive close on this. He says, well, when you pray, he never said if you pray, he said, when you pray. And he said, and when you fast. So there's this applied or implied command that Jesus is just making the assumption that all the people that follow him are praying and are fasting. But it's interesting because he goes through kind of some do's and don'ts 
about prayer and fasting in these lists. And if you go through and look at, look at it, they all have something in common, both the do's and the don'ts, right? He said, you know, don't be like the hypocrites. Don't pray on street corners and shout loudly to be seen by people, you know, because they have the reward. Or when you fast, don't disfigure your face and look all sad, you know, and appear to be fasting. You know, don't pray loud. Don't pray. Or, and then he says, do pray in secret. Don't use vain repetitions, you know, in shouting out these things over and over. Rather, pray like the model prayer. Don't be obvious that you're fasting. Instead, bathe. You know, he says, anoint your hair with oil. I think of that as shampoo. You know, I don't know. Whatever. He's, but he's saying, you know, like, be clean. You know, take care of yourself just as you would as if you weren't fasting. The main thing that he's showing here is that both prayer and fasting, the main focus of what it is, is that there is no room for pride. There is just zero room for pride in either one of these. And if these are the basic instructions that Jesus gives concerning prayer and fasting, then that means that both prayer and fasting must have something to do with humility, which is the opposite of pride. You see, prayer is very simply, in its most simple and basic form, prayer is nothing more than just communication with God. Now that alone is kind of like a big deal to be able to communicate. If we think about this, the God of the universe who created everything, you know, we would get excited if we meet the, you know, the person who created our favorite song, or we get, you know, someone who created a movie that we like or something like that. And we're talking about, we get to have a standing audience with the God of the universe who created it all. This is what prayer is, but it is simplistic in its idea. It's communication with God. But I can tell you right now, there is something that will hinder that communication. And that is pride. Pride can hinder communication with God because prayer within prayer is this idea that we are dependent on God. We're dependent on him for our healing, for our daily needs, our intercession for others, our hope. We're dependent on God and pride will get in the way of that realization. David continually throughout the Psalms praises God for his faithfulness in caring for him and protecting him and providing for him. David had another reputation besides the man after God's own heart, right? Does anyone know what David's reputation was? The warrior. He was a warrior king. This is, you know, he had mighty men. The people who were below him were doing things like fighting lions with their bare hands. One guy stands in a bean field and kills, I don't know what, like 100,000 soldiers coming at him by himself. I mean, like, this is like way more than than, you know, Jason Bourne. Like these are mighty men, you know, and David is like the ruler of all of them. He's the guy that got the mighty men. He's the one that kills Goliath. He's the one that, you know, said he took out the, the lion and took out a bear and, you know, did all these things. He's a warrior. You would think, what can a warrior do? I can protect myself. I can provide for myself because I am King David, right? What is his attitude? He wrote Psalm 23. For the Lord is my shepherd. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me besides the still waters. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Your rod, boy, I switched to King James there for a minute. Your rod and your staff comfort me. You know, David was like, I rely on God. I rely on him. He's my protector. He's my provision. There was no, I can do this. Even when he faced Goliath, and he's like, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? It wasn't, well, I can do it because I'm David. He was like, he's mocking God. He, already, he saw his defeat before he ever got there because he's like, this guy's mocking God. There's no way he can stand. All we need is someone to go before him, knock him down. Like He sealed his own fate. David understood this. He didn't have pride. So when he approached things, he approached them in that sense of humility. And yet this was a very capable guy, you know? Fasting is not eating for a, spe a specified period of time. It's a plain and simple, very easy definition of it. But the purpose of fasting is to humble yourself and to deny your physical flesh for the purpose of elevating God. And so when we fast, it's almost like supercharging our prayer life. 
because within prayer, humility opens up things and having that humble spirit. And sometimes fasting is what's required to get us into that mindset, into that place. Humility is an essential posture to having your prayers answered. In Philippians 2, 5 through 9, it says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God has also highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every other name. We see within Jesus, who's to be the one that is our example. He's the one we follow, right? He's the firstborn uh, from the dead. You know, he is the one that goes before us. He says, it says, he was equal to God, but humbled himself even to the point of death. Meaning he left that deity behind so much so that he was able to be killed. Like that's how much man he was that he cast off immortality to take that on to show us how we can truly live forever. And he did that because that was humility. He was God. He, you know, he also could have not done that and got all the way up to the cross and then be like, ha ha, still divine, you know, and taking everybody out that was trying to, you know, what, but he didn't. He allowed it to happen because that was the father's plan. And so our example is this extreme humility in James 4.10, it says, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. The, in the example we saw with Jesus, it says, Once he humbled himself, it says, Therefore God has also highly exalted him, giving him the name above every other name. And then we're told that when we humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord, he will lift us up. You know, Jesus had things like, you know, he who wants to be the greatest should be the least of these. Humility is in that place. When we want, when we need God to lift us up and to raise us up, humility is where we start. In James 4, 6, it says, but he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. The last thing I want is God resisting my prayers. But when you come in with this attitude of pride in our prayers, God resists those. It's like, no. That's not how you approach the Father. Now, I know we have grace, and I'm a huge proponent of grace and not of do's and don'ts, and I do believe God meets us where we're at when we're learning things. But when we approach God in a place of pride, He's going to use that as a teaching opportunity to say, you know, wait, let's, you know, once you come back. I mean, how many parents have had a child come up and demand something, and you go, why don't you ask again? Like, has anyone ever heard that or said it? Yes. <laughs> right? I have had God say that to me. <laughs> Why don't you step back and ask again? And you're like, oh yeah, I realize. You know, sometimes I've done that and had pride in my prayers and not really realize it. Uh, sometimes it's even something that I may be praying for someone else, but I have these prayers where I start off with like, you know, God, look at what I've done. You know, I've been serving or I've done this and I, so I ask, because I've done these things, would, that you would answer this prayer. Or, Lord, this person over here is sick and needs healing, and they're such a mighty person in your kingdom. They do all this work. They serve. They're the most faithful in the church, Lord, so I pray that you would heal them. What is that? Like, as though anything that I have ever done or anything that anyone else has ever done is like, so impressive to God that he's like, oh, well, yeah, I think I'll cast off this whole grace thing and go back to works and make that happen. You know, like, like, what are we doing? Because I don't think about it sometimes. I'm not thinking and giving conscious thought to what am I praying? What am I standing here before God saying, look at how faithful we are. Look at how great we are. In Isaiah 64, 6, it says, but we are all like an unclean thing and all our righteousnesses which, by the way, props to Isaiah for making a word like righteousness is. <laughs> that is not a word. All our righteous works are like filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. And yes, I know that that is an Old Testament scripture, and he doesn't have the blood of Christ on him to make him righteous. 
but it's the same principle is true. Our, our righteousnesses, our righteous works compared to God. Like, do we really think that we have actually done something so amazing that compared to God, it's worthy of him doing something? Rather, it's because of his love. Because he loves us, because he cares for us, because we are his children, we approach him as our father. And that's why I say pride has no place in our prayer life. And fasting is generally the answer to pride. Now, I'm going to start off with prayer because we've actually covered it a little bit. When we go back to the Sermon on the Mount and, and where we left off with you know, him saying, go into your secret place and pray. In Matthew 6, 8 through 13, he picks it up and he says, pray like this. Therefore, well, therefore do not be like them, for your Father knows the things that you have need of before you ask Him. In this manner, therefore, pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, in June and July of last year, we looked at this model prayer for five weeks and we went through it. So if you want a more in-depth thing on prayer in that, like go back, look at those messages or talk to me. We can go over it, but I don't want to rehash that same message, even though it's, you know, it's been almost a year. But essentially prayer is communication. And in this model prayer, Jesus encourages us to pray to approach God based on our relationship with him as father. And this is our primary relationship with God. He's our father. We not, he is these things, but it's not our primary relationship that he's our judge or our creator or our king. Our primary relationship with him is as father. And then he says, and then we praise him. We declare his holiness. Hallowed be your name. You know, this is about his greatness. Notice the position of humility this starts us off in acknowledging how great and awesome God is, how holy he is. Then we pray for his kingdom to come and his will be done, which again is humility because we're saying your will, not my will, your kingdom, not my culture. We're approaching God from that place of humility. Then give us to stay our daily bread. We ask for our needs. It's full reliance on him. Again, that's humility because it's saying it's not my place to provide I'm going to rely on you. We then ask for forgiveness and we forgive others. Both of those have to come from places of humility, humbled before God because we have sinned, humbled towards others because we weren't willing to hold their sins against them. We ask for prayer, uh, or sorry, we ask for protection from temptation. Again, it's a reliance on him. No, my willpower is not enough. I don't even know that willpower actually exists. We have the spirit in us who can give us power to overcome temptation. It's reliance on him. We pray for deliverance from the enemy, his power, not ours. Any authority that we do have, and we do have authority, is only because it has been delegated to us. And it is from him. And so, and then we end with worship. You know, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Worship as we talked about just a little bit earlier, a few weeks ago, worship is, igno is acknowledging that he is greater than us, that he is so much higher than us. The entire Lord's Prayer, the model prayer that we go through, is steeped in this position of humility. Now, there's a lot more to it. Like I said, we talked about it for five weeks, so obviously, hopefully, there's more to it. But you can see this attitude that humility should define our attitudes in prayer. Now, fasting, reasons that we have for fasting, and the first and foremost reason for fasting is to increase our humility, to humble us. In Psalm 35, 13, David said, but as for me, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. I humbled myself with fasting and my prayer would return to my own heart. And David said, this is what I needed. When I came in before God, I used fasting to put me into a position of humility to stand before God in that way. I love this story in Ezra. Ezra 
uh, is at a, a place where they've been in captivity. Israel has been in captivity and now the king is releasing them and they can go back and they can go back to rebuild their temple. And this is what in Ezra 8, 21 to 23, Ezra says, there, then I proclaimed a fast there at the river of Ahava that we might humble ourselves before our God to seek from him the right way for us and our little ones and all our possessions. For I was ashamed to request of the king an escort of soldiers and horsemen to help us against the enemy on the road, because we had spoken to the king, saying, The hand of our God is upon all those for good who seek him, but his power and his wrath are against all those who forsake him. So we fasted and entreated our God for this, and he answered our prayer. So first of all, I'll point out something here is that Ezra called for a corporate fast. You can fast as a corporate, as a church, as a city, as a nation, you know, whatever. There can be corporate fasts. Here, he did it for all of the entourage that was going to be going back. And he says, I love what's happened here. Is he says, I told, <laughs> he says, I, I can't go back and tell the king we need an escort. The way back home is dangerous. It's filled with people who will rob you, who will beat you up, take everything you have and leave you on the road naked and bleeding. This is the road that we're going to be traveling, right? Not a good thing. This is like downtown Chicago. And, you know, you don't want to do it. You don't want to be out there on their own. They're like, but that's the way home. But also, I'm like embarrassed to go to the king and ask for an escort. And the reason is because just earlier I was bragging to the king that God is our protector, that God is on our side and he will protect us and he will destroy all of our enemies before us. And I don't want to go and God is great and God will save us and God will do this and he'll defeat our enemies. And also, could you provide some soldiers to give us protection on the road? He's like, I don't want to do that. But also, this is where the rubber meets the road. I believe that God can protect me. I believe that he's on our side and I believe he can defeat our enemies. But we're about to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. We're about to take that trip home through robber country. We need to fast and pray and find out, am I doing, am I saying we're not going to take protection with us because I'm too proud? Or am I doing this because of who God really is? And that's why they fasted and prayed. And God answered them and God said, you go without the escort. And they made it and they didn't have any problems. They got there all safe, every one of them there. And, you know, this is this thing, it's this real issue he had to, decide, but he didn't want to do it out of pride. This was a very severe decision that had to be made where if you remember, it even started off with, it says, um, you know, we wanted to seek from him the right way to go for us and our little ones, you know, their children. And if you got a very modern translation, it would be like for us and the littles, but <clears throat> but, you know, he's like, this has, this has real consequences. Whatever decision we make is going to have consequences for our family. So they brought themselves to fasting and prayer so that they could say, we are making this decision because this is truly what God wants. And it's not my own arrogance or pride determining what's going to happen. We also see fasting when there's judgment of God. In 1 Kings 21, 25 through 29, it says, but there was no one like Ahab, who sold himself to do wickedness in the sight of the Lord because Jezebel, his wife, stirred him up. And he behaved very abominably in following idols, according to all that the Amorites had done, whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. So it was when Ahab heard those words that he tore his clothes and put sackcloth on his body and fasted and lay in sackcloth and went about mourning. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, See how Ahab has humbled himself before me. Because he has humbled himself before me, I will not bring calamity in his days. In the days of his son, I will bring calamity on the house. So here we have the most evil king in all of Israel to this point. And he was spared because he humbled himself with fasting and repentance. And so we see him being spared for judgment. I don't think I'll read this whole next one because I think we all know this one pretty good. And in Jonah chapter 3, 5 through 10, we see the story of, of Nineveh. And it says that basically that the king of Nineveh de declared a fast throughout the nation 
for everyone to put on sackcloth and sit in ashes and to, uh, they actually, he said, not to eat or even drink water for three days because he was serious. Like we're repenting. And it says, God relented from the disaster that he said he would bring upon them and he did not do it. They changed God's mind because they repented. This is why oftentimes we'll see things like Christian churches will come together to say, we believe our nation is facing judgment of God. We need to come together and fast and prayer and we call for that because there's biblical precedent for that. And I do believe that God still brings judgment on nations. I think that we still see him, you know, putting things down to us because we reap what we sow. And you may not be sowing it personally, but we're part of a greater that is. And in 2 Chronicles seven fourteen, it says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. And the word that's used there for humble themselves is a word that also means fasting. So when people would have heard this at that time, in the time of Second Chronicles, they would have heard him say, if my people will fast, will humble themselves with fasting and pray and seek my face and repent, then I will hear, then I will forgive, then I will heal. You know, there's such a thing of humbling ourselves before God and saying, you are right. What we have done has not been what you've called us to do. True repentance requires humility because it's saying we didn't follow your ways. I went after my own thoughts, my own desires, my own lusts, whatever, and I didn't put you ahead. I didn't seek your face. But God says when you will humble yourselves and realize that and repent and turn, I'm right there. I'm faithful. I will bring you up. I will heal you. Perhaps one of the most common ways that we see fasting used today is getting direction from God, hearing supernaturally, what does God want us to do? You know, a lot of people have this question and they'll come up. I, you know, one of the most common prayer requests I get is pray for me for wisdom because I've got to make this big decision, right? Big decision coming up. Let's see how they handled this in, in the New Testament, uh, you know, right at the very beginning of the church. In Acts 13, 1 through 3, it says, Now in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, who had been brought up with, the, with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then, having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. Here we actually see two times of fasting and praying happening. One is that as they were ministering, they were fasting and praying, looking at like what to do. We've got these leaders, but you know, what's the direction? What's God do? And then the Holy Spirit speaks to them with clarity. Separate from me these two. They're going to become the first missionaries. And then it says they spent time fasting and praying probably to ensure that they were hearing correctly and hear what God is. And then they did that and they sent them away. They laid hands and sent them away. And the first two missionaries were sent out of the church. And that was done because of the leading of the Holy Spirit through fasting and praying. In Acts 14, 21 to 23, it says, And when they had preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith and saying, we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. So when they had appointed elders in every church and prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. You see, what's been happening here is the church has been built, getting built up. More and more believers are coming in every city and they're having to establish churches to care for the people, to bring them, you know, disciple them, bring them up into maturity, do stuff. And so they're like, we can't, as the disciples and the apostles alone, they can't do that. They can't be in every city. They can't do this. So they're like, well, we're the apostles. We can go around. We need elders to step up in the churches and take and to lead the churches. And in order to figure out who should be the elders and leading the churches, they fasted and prayed. And that was how they got the direction from God. 
And then I'll give one more benefit of fasting. Fasting is used to disconnect from the world and to reconnect with God. Uh, in Matthew 7, 14 through 21, it says, When they had come to the multitude, a man came to him kneeling down and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic and suffers severely. For he often falls into the fire and often into the water. So I brought him to your disciples, but they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you and how long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon and it came out of him and the child was cured from that very hour. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, why could we not cast it out? And Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief, for assuredly I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move and nothing will be impossible for you. However, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. So when they couldn't do it, Jesus referred to this generation as a faithless and perverse generation. How long do I have to put up with a faithless and perverse generation? Well, the word faithless is a pistos, which actually just means without faith or meaning an unbeliever. He's talking about someone who just simply doesn't believe. Um, Basically, this is also the same word that's used for apostasy, someone who renounces their faith in Jesus and gives it up. Essentially, what Jesus is saying when he calls them a faithless generation is he's saying this is a, fa a generation that has completely disconnected from God. This is a um, group of people that has not connected to God. Now, he's talking to his disciples and to people who have come to him that are standing before him. And this is how he's referring to them. So it's not that they didn't have any faith or faith in God or faith that Jesus was God. They were there because they believed he was God to, to cast out this demon. But the problem was there wasn't this connection to God. They weren't fully connected to him. And that's why he uses this word apistos with them. He also called them perverse. Now, perverse in modern language has a slightly different meaning. That's not what Jesus was talking about. It's a word called diastropho, but it basically means corrupt or amoral. Uh, it's the same word that's used uh, in Philippians 2.15, where Paul writes that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Perverse basically is just meaning something that's not of God, anything that is not of God. Um, in fact, in the Bible, it talks about like we have to take off the corruptible and put on the incorruptible. And that's that same word, perverse, the corruptible. It's the world. It's the things of this world that are perishing. So what Jesus was saying is the reason you could not cast out that demon is because you're not connected to God enough. You're too connected to the world. And then he gives them instruction. And the instruction that he gives them is not so you need to connect with God and disconnect from the world. He says, this kind comes out by prayer and fasting. Because what is prayer? It's connection with God. It's communicating with God. It's a connection. That's how we build that connection. You want to get connected to God? Pray. Prayer is where it's at. And then he says, and fasting. Because what is fasting? Fasting is denying our flesh. It's denying the physical. It's taking the focus off the physical. So fasting becomes disconnecting from the world. And it's, and it's this beautiful picture that Jesus gives of where does the real power in life come from? Connection with God, disconnecting from the world. <laughs> Prayer and fasting may not be like the, the most Pentecostiest message that you could possibly give on Pentecost Sunday. And yet, I actually think that there's something really, uh, there's a really strong connection there. Because Pentecost is realizing that the God of the universe is in us. It's a celebration of the fulfillment of the promise of Jesus that he was in his spirit to fill us up, to bring us life, to put his power in us. And, and that happened. And when we became saved, we received his spirit. And we can pray for that filling and that baptism of the spirit. And we can get connected to God. Prayer, understand, is that's its basis, its connection with God. Why is it that we can stand before God and pray? Because we're connected by His Spirit. 
Yeah. I mean, I understand the whole, you know, you can go through the whole thing in Hebrews of how Jesus' blood stands before us, washes us clean. It's his righteousness, not our righteousness. All that comes down to this. We were made alive to Jesus. That's because his spirit is in us. We're connected to his spirit. His spirit in us brings us life and it brings us that connection. And we live our lives with a constant choice set before us. Do I want to be connected to God and in his spirit and to him and the power of him and the, you know, everything that's associated with that? Or am I going to let my focus drift off and just be connected to the world and keep everything that I know is grounded into this material, physical, corruptible world that's perishing before my very eyes? And sort of when you put it like that, it's kind of a no brainer and it should be a no brainer as we live throughout our lives. But the physical world stands here with like a whole lot of flashing neon signs in our face, assaulting our senses every day, going the physical, the physical is right here. And God is in that still small voice saying, my spirit dwells in you. You Choose life. Choose God. We choose to live by the spirit. This is what Paul wrestled with as we read in Romans 7. You know, who would deliver me from this life that I live in this flesh? But I thank my God, Jesus Christ is that answer. So today, if we find ourselves in that place where, you know, there are things that we need, we need direction, we need wisdom, we have his spirit in us. The the actually straightforward, most easy way to access that, to live by his guidance, his direction, is to put ourselves into a position of humility and pray and ask God for what we need. When we pray and we find that there's just this stumbling block, there's something there that's, that feels like it's one, the one question. Now I'll say like, you know, there's other things that could be happening to us and maybe we've found ourselves in a lifestyle of sin or something else and that's something we, you know, God may be saying, I want you to repent. But most of the time when we pray and we feel like there's something stopping. Ask yourself, is there any bit of pride in us? And the easiest way to deal with that and the most direct way to deal with that is to say, I'm going to fast for some time. And we're going to pray and ask God for leadership. You know, and fasting doesn't have, you don't have to go, you know, full Jesus or Elijah mode and hit the 40 days, you know, like, you know, a day. There's a lot of fasts that are called in the Bible that are three-day fasts. There are fasts in the Bible that are simply over a specific meal. You know, there are lots of different fasts mentioned in the Bible, and I don't necessarily want to get into like, you know, here's exactly how you have to do it and whatever else. You know, some people water only, some people liquids only. You know, I tried to say one time, convince myself I could do a fast, but I could do, I would do a liquid only fast, but then I did like all meal replacement shakes. (laughs) <laughs> I'm not sure that it's actually denying your flesh. <laughs> so, you know, the point is, you know, you're not looking for loopholes. We're looking for connection with God. We're looking for humility. And so it's this way that we can just, it simply is something to supercharge. And so it's this discipline. It's one of the spiritual disciplines that helps bring us into a place where we're closer to God. And no, neither one of these things, prayer nor fasting, is ever listed as like, if you don't do this, you can't be saved. If you don't do this, God will turn his back on you and desert you. They're, they're not there. But what I'm saying is that if you want to walk in the fellowship of Jesus, if you want to be someone that's after his own heart, if you want to grow and mature in your faith, if you want to have victory over circumstances, the disciplines are set up to bring us to that place and to get us there because you're, you know, everything can be better. It's the same way. The only thing that's required to be married is a marriage license. But I'll tell you, remembering anniversaries is a great thing. <laughs> remembering birthdays and, you know, remembering what they like to eat or what they like to do or saying things. You know, there's all these things we can do that just makes that relationship that much better. And it's like that with God. And that's what these disciplines do. So, Father, we thank you that you have given us ways. You have shown us in your word how we can connect with you 
how we can cast off the things of this world, how we can call on your name and you are always faithful to answer. And I thank you that you are a good father who does give us the answers, that when we ask for wisdom, you don't throw stones at us or give us a scorpion or whatever. You don't play games with us, Lord. We thank you that you are faithful and true. And Holy Spirit, we are grateful that you live in us, that your power is in us. Lord, again, I pray for that filling that everyone would be filled fully in your spirit. We thank you that you are here with us and in us. And Lord, we give glory to your name and we praise you and bless you. Amen.